Are you seriously gonna eat you fat? Libity blabity blob. I mean, some of you might be like, continue. Why would I want to start this? Sensitive. She's sensitive. She's. You are listening to the Tammy Talks Unscripted Healing Podcast, where we share stories that are, you guessed it, unscripted. That's the thing. This journey doesn't. Stop, it doesn't really right? end. We have a general sense of the topic each episode, but really the whole point is just to show up and be authentic and let our inner child speak its truth. And I have continued to work through that story of constantly hearing, well, we don't want got a hot dog on our hands. Yeah, guess what, Mr. Sabatsky, you do. So I'm so excited that you are here and it is my hope that you hear yourself somewhere in the story so that way you can feel seen and heard as well. So let's start talking. Welcome to the Tammy Talks Unscripted Healing Podcast. For those of you that have been listening all along, welcome back. And for those of you that are brand new, um, I'm excited that you're here. This is a very, very special episode, very close to my heart. And I'm so excited to introduce you to this amazing human who I have literally known my entire life. But before I share who this special person is, It's so interesting how timing always works. I am a big believer in divine timing, and I always trust that everything unfolds as it's supposed to. And it's so funny because I hosted a retreat back in April, and the women there, they knew me very, very well. So they knew that I'm someone that kind of flies by the seat of my pants. And for a lot of them, they are very scheduled down to the minute, know what they're doing for months ahead. So it's very triggering for them. For me to be like, okay, but I trust that. I trust that everything is going to fall into place. And obviously there is planning that goes into all of these things. But I also know that I have to flow with things. And if I'm ever meeting resistance, I sit with that. And it's so interesting that this particular podcast episode has been something that has, you know, really been a conversation that started years ago. When I first started getting into inner child work and I had this conversation with this person, my mind was blown by all the trauma that was wrapped up into this moment that had never been talked about. You know, and the more I have dove into this inner child work, I can see how important this topic really is. And so I have wanted to bring this person on since I started this podcast. And it was so funny to me because when I reached out one day, I was talking to a friend at the gym and I was like, you know what, I really want to I really want to have this person on. And I kind of shared a little bit of the story. And then sure enough, I get home and I text this person and I say, hey, what you doing? And turns out this person was thinking about this event that we're going to be talking about two days before and was actually thinking about trying to get some closure around it some healing around it. And then here I am like, hey, you want to be on the podcast to talk about it? It just it, it aligned so beautifully. And so I'm actually, I'm doing this little intro video for you right now. And then I am going to get in my car and I'm going to drive an hour and a half back to my childhood home. And I am going to have my dad as your guest. And again, this wasn't timed, but it's Father's Day weekend. I'm going to get all emotional now. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. I'm not sorry. Because like, it feels like such a gift to be able to give him this space to be seen and heard in one of the experiences that shaped his life in so many ways. And I just have such a deep love for my dad. He is one of my people and I'm so grateful to have him in my life and always in my corner. And I hope to have him on for more episodes because he has inspired me in so many ways. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here doing this crazy entrepreneurial stuff if I didn't have my dad as a model for what it takes to get out there and just go for it. So I hope that he comes back and talks about that someday. But we got a whole episode for you today that I'm like shaky, (laughs) excited and nervous, not nervous. I'm just, I'm, I just, I know how I can already feel how big it's going to be to witness um, what we're going to do today and and just know how healing it's going to be for him and that little boy inside of him. And so I'm so excited to bring him on, but I, uh, I better wrap this up because I got an hour and a half drive ahead of me so I can bring you guys one of my absolute favorite guests. So stay tuned.
All right, I made it back to my hometown and I have my very special guest here with me. My father, Baja, as I like to refer to him. Usually, <laughs> usually when we greet each other, I'm like, hello, father. Yeah. And her daughter. Full daughter. And then this is our hug. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I've, as you guys know, I like to do things unscripted. And it was funny because on my way down here, I posted in my social media stories, I had packed my lunch and I had packed supper just in case. And I said, I leave nothing to chance when it comes to my nutrition. And then I forgot my computer charger. And so when I got to my parents' place, I had 34% battery. And so it's created a two hours of what are we going to do? <laughs> and then we've been doing some trial and error and we noticed at my parents was the Wi-Fi was not great. And so for those of you watching on YouTube, like this isn't gonna work. So we are now at my dad's office and he is, well, I'll let you share a little bit about what you do. We'll dive into the, the real reason you're here, but why are there saws and things in the wall? Yeah. There. I have uh, instruction. I have the, uh... well, we do everything from Building houses, late commercial work, uh, building, um, get our own concrete business, electrical business, a whole lot of construction workers. Um, my office here kind of represents some of that. We have some of the other tools we use that over the years. We have a lot of funny sayings that have pictures on my grandchildren in here and some of the sayings they do for me. Yeah. Basically, this is kind of where I am my day now. All the way from home. If, you yeah. were, if I were to give you a tour, you would see you got all like the grandkids' drawings and things on the wall. It's a little bit. It's a little bit. It's a little bit. Oh, so yeah, I had mentioned, I believe in my little intro video that I wanted him back at some point to talk about this aspect because it's super inspiring to hear his full story about where you guys started and where you are now. And he has been my entrepreneurial inspiration all of these years and I would not be doing what I'm doing if I didn't have him modeling what it's like to take big risks and to put yourself out there and a lot of the healing that I have had to do in order I was gonna say if you ever want to heal your childhood wounds go into entrepreneurship <laughs> and I'll trigger every single one of them no. but I know that that's part of it and that's why I am put in this position but it's been really awesome to have conversations with you you know around worthiness and you know we've had the money conversation a million times like how do you value yourself and your services but there's so much more you know to just feel even like who am i to fill in the blank and and you just you're such a model of that so so yeah i'm hoping to have him on some time to share that story because it, it's pretty incredible the reason that i wanted to have him on here was well one well, and again i did not time this that i mentioned this in the intro video too but I, we've had this conversation years ago. So when I first started getting into inner child work, Dan and I sat down and started talking about something that happened to him. Uh, well, we just figured out coming up on 55 years ago. So 54 years ago, 54 years ago, this thing happened. And that was the first time, like I had ever really heard the whole story. And it felt like the first time that you had really opened up or even like saw it from this different perspective. And I was like, oh, and so, and it's come up several times on the podcast. And actually on last week's episode, I was talking with Christy about how some of these, some of this childhood trauma doesn't always directly happen to you. Sometimes it can be something that you witnessed and then you can take on different aspects of that. And I've talked about, you know, we experience physical trauma, but there's emotional trauma. And his story is, is pretty, uh, yeah, felt like it needed to be shared. But the timing of him coming on is also very interesting because you didn't have this plan. As you guys know, I, I run things. He does. <laughs> it just it worked out perfect that it was, we were going to record this week. So this episode is going to air on Tuesday. It's going to be Father's Day on Sunday. Never thought of that. And you're right. Oh, and then I, when I was whole and I was going to the shop you know, in our basement, luckily didn't convert my 
childhood bedroom, but it's close. He got close to it. But I was down there this afternoon and I saw this on the wall. I have a beverage for you guys. I don't know how old I was, but I gave this to you. Candy and I kind of broke it okay. intentionally because I was going to wear it as my, as my blank. So those of you that are listening, I have this really cool heart that you hang in the window and it says, I love my daddy. So like, oh, it just happened to like glare at me when I was down in your shop today. So I was going to bring that. That's like two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it was probably. You were very school. Yeah. 30, well, let's not talk about that. <laughs> Underneath you. But again, it just is like, oh my gosh, like what perfect timing to have you on because again, he has been my role model for so long and not just the entrepreneurial stuff. Like my dad, so those of you that know him, he is like the biggest kid. <laughs> he is the only, yeah. Yeah. like failing things. He is always like the biggest kid there. And you've kept traditions alive from your dad of like having a pinata at Easter and and just making things really special, like at Christmas, you know, just the way that he engages with the grandkids and even us, he's just always had this very playful spirit. And it's been really cool to witness how he, without even knowing, has continued to tap into his inner child all these years by the hobbies that you do, all the woodworking stuff that you do, like that's where you go to your happy place or, you know, bringing, you know, we grew up on a farm. He sold the cattle when I was in the seventh grade, the milking cows. And he has brought back like beef cattle and rabbits and they've had chickens at times. Like the dude just can't like not be outside and having a hobby. Like he, you find things that bring you joy and are intentional about doing those things. I like doing that too. I mean, it's like you said, the rabbits and chickens. A lot of that's for me, but it's also something to do with the grandkids. When they come back, they... They can experience some of that. Yeah. It's enjoyable to watch them be a part of it. Yeah. Well, so and I all about me. It's, it was it's yeah. sharing that experience with them. And I, as a parent who now lives in the city, like I appreciate that. I will yeah. never forget me and Madison who went to Cowell on the Concourse. So at the state capitol in Madison, they brought cows and they had them in a pen. And one of them needed to use the restroom. <laughs> and they brought a baby wipe and wiped the cow. And I, Said to my daughter, who was not old enough to comprehend, I'm like that is not what happens in the real world, Aria. Like I'm taking you back to Grand Bus, and we're going to see what really happens. Yeah. But I, I, I so appreciate having that as like this home base where they can experience just life in a different way. But and even though you, part of that is for them. It's a beautiful way to like reparent your inner child and to do things that help you connect. With, with little Paul by doing those things and not just it all being here and being about work, like you find ways to connect with yourself. Like those molars outside doing chores, like that's your quiet time to just be with you, you know, or when you're woodworking. Yeah. What you do, a beef caliber, I say we used to mock cow there when we got away from that. The beef caliber were relaxing for me. Yeah. I even on a watch sandwich when I'm eating them. It is a quiet time for me to kind of line from the day at work. And, uh, yeah, like enjoying it. Some people call it work, but I, I call that a vacation or a pleasure for me. Right. Well, and I, I yeah. just I love how you just you were intentional about doing that, whether or not you realized what you were really doing. It you're just so intuitive in that way. And so I definitely I get my dad's intuitive vibes. So. <laughs> but the reason that I wanted him to come on and and talk because I have shared a lot about how our, our physical bodies, you know, we take on trauma and like the emotions that we maybe don't allow ourselves to feel. And in our society, when someone gets physically hurt, like it makes sense, we have to tend to that need right away, right? Especially if it's life or death kind of thing. But what often gets missed or neglected is the emotional stuff. And I had talked about that, about that little boy from third grade who had experienced physical trauma, but was healed, but no one had ever addressed the emotional trauma from that. He was still really hurting. And that's why he wasn't smiling anymore because he was crying for help. Like, does anyone notice I'm not a happy little boy anymore? And so it made me think about my dad's story. And so I asked him to come on and share this. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Go ahead. So when you were 11, no. my dad is a twin. And growing up, we had the picture at home, but we left it on set there. We're at set two. <laughs> so my dad, like I said, he's a twin. And I grew up knowing those two, like two peas in a pod. And you guys were incredibly close, worked yes. together. They built this business together. And, and I always knew something had happened. My uncle had, you know, a limp and would be like walking around and we had hip surgery. It's like, I knew this stuff, but I didn't really ever know the story and what actually happened. And so when we started talking a couple of years ago, when I was, like I said, diving into inner child work and you told me this story, like my heart just like, I just wanted to run to that 11 year old boy and give him the biggest hug. And so I just wanted to give you this space to be sure. seen and heard in that experience and hopefully feel lots of, of love. Yeah, it's, it's, I've never really talked about it. Like I say, we were 11 years old with that with catcher accident. I've never, I always wanted to share it with my daughter. We had my four daughters. And I've never really knew how to open up to them and tell them. I didn't know what they used to know of. But then as we, she started her childhood thing here, I think it was time to bring that up and be sure it with you. So we had to help, help someone else. Like me, I think I've gone over it, but I really haven't. More I talk to Tammy, the more it comes back. And I really, I guess I've still been able to clip. I remember, I never knew that through all these years. I would say I'm kidding, four years. And, uh, yeah, but look back at that, it was pretty traumatic for a living room. Do so. you want to talk about what happened and <laughs> share the event? Well, like I say, we, we grew up in the farm. I mean, a, a big dairy with eight of us kids. Um, we were all expected to, to work. I mean, it was part of life back then. And uh, we were driving tractor at six years old. And uh, my brother feet was, like say, Daniel Clinton. He was running the baler, which when I say running the baler, he was driving a tractor, pulling the baler behind him in the wagon. And my my dad was uh, loading the hay on that, on that rock. And uh, I was the one that had to take the tractor out to the field and uh, all that load of hay into the barn. That was my job back and forth, back and forth. And if some of you will understand the old balers, they had the baling twine, they were in bales, and it was two in a bundle. And around those bundles with a, a rope, like a half inch rope, probably eight, 10 feet long, but it wrapped in bales. And as little boys, we had to save them. You know, we were going to do something with them someday. We were going to make something out of that. You are still that way. Let me find this scrap thing and I'll turn it into something. This is all coming together now. <laughs> yeah. So every time um, my dad and my brother would change the paper, he would, uh, I got my brother's name is Pete. And he would save that rope until I got back out there with another load. And he'd run over the tractor, hand it up to me. I'd take it back to the barn. It took me a special hiding place. Nobody else would find it. We needed that right here to build whatever we were going to build. And uh, the patent you know, throughout the day. And the one time, it's a pretty good sized tractor, your brother, or I was. And he walked up to the tractor with that rope. Stand in front of the back tire while well, I leaned over to, to grab the string and my foot came off the clutch. Which <laughs> Yeah, that's accurate. I mean, part of it. Yeah, that's bad to do. Yeah. Sorry, I cried on your own. <laughs> well, I wasn't supposed to be happy. But anyway, uh that's all right. That's surprising. Good. Coming back like that. But uh yeah, I, I ran up, ran over top and up to his hip, um, crushing uh, quite a bit of it. And uh, I back, back off. My dad came along over there, he picked feet up. We had the hay rack was empty at the time. And uh, laid him on there. There was nobody out in the field. Just, we were probably half a mile from the barn. And my dad told me, he said, you, you watch him. Keep talking to him, keep him awake. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna get help, go get a car or something. So he was still conscious. We, we uh, I was standing by him and dead, but off. On the road near, brought that field. I'll never forget that how that tractor was 
flying across that field. And for some after safety reason, our neighbor was driving by and seen dad going across the field 30 miles an hour, wherever he's going. He came out, he knew something was wrong, he came out. And uh, by the time dad came back out to their car, at that time there was no ambulances and stuff like that. There was no. Okay. What would you say, 1970? 1970. And there was no local spot and stuff. So um, my dad would fly out of the car. We talked to people, the whole time he was there. And, it wasn't, it wasn't good. He just opened up. Yeah. And uh, I remember my dad, busy at an old Billy, he would car. That's a 225. I'll never forget that. Him and the neighbor ripped the back seat out of that car for a stretcher, ran up to the wagon, and we slid Pete onto that seat. Lift the back seat of an old car, and they both ferried him in the car, and the height where Highway 18 wasn't too far from the field, probably 100 yards. And they took off and headed to the hospital. And I was left in the field standing there and didn't know what to do. I didn't even know at the time, but to this day, I still don't know how I got out of that field. I don't remember that. Um, anyway, and my, and my sister was, my oldest sister was getting married that week. I think it was on a We'll say it was on Monday or Tuesday or something. She was getting married Saturday at, at the home farm. And uh, obviously, Pete was in the hospital. And mom and dad asked me, somebody had to stay with Pete during the wedding. And I said, I'll, I'll stay there. I'll stay with him. So they proceeded with the wedding. I was in the hospital with my brother. And um, the wedding party actually came up to the hospital. And uh, he had seen us. But um, I spent the whole day with them. I'll never forget that night. Um, actually, that's been 50 years ago. Somehow he got overdosed oh. with a painkiller. You know. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was yelling for help. The elephants were in the room. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I remember me yelling for that. And, um, I took off this at 11 o'clock at night. And sort of, here I am running down the hallway, you know, young old nurses trying to get them up there. And we, we did. And we got back to the, the room. And I'll never forget that. Just put, put the light on. It was done. You come out of it. But it was, um, I look back and now, when, I raised, when the girls were raised, when they were getting that age, I thought, my God, you know, I was that young at that time. And then when I had our grandchildren, each one of them, when they turned 10 or 11 years old, I got thinking, how could, how would they have handled this? And, Stop uh, that's all right. That's, yeah, that's all right. And, call for 11. Yeah. and uh, at that time, we didn't take nothing other from the equipment at that age. We were, we just, that's just our life, not with everything. But I never, nobody ever talked about it. And I never looked down on people. I was never upset with that. That's just what you did. You kept it wrong in life. Yeah. And uh, we did. We, we just go out of life. And then we, when we got out of the hospital, he was on crushes for two months. We had to start school. And our whole schoolhouse was uh, three stories up, their classroom. And lo and behold, I mean, he was a godsend. There was a new teacher that year. The name of Mr. Windshield. I wish I, I don't know where he ever went. I wish I could contact me, that man again. But he worked at a, a camp during the summers, handicapped. Wow. And wow. He was, that was his first year teaching at um, Patch Broke High School. Oh, Mr. Sewell. And he, he took over. He got feet up and down those steps every day, every night and morning, three flights of stairs during recess, during lunch, for school, after school. And he taught him how to use a wheelchair. And um, let's see, he was in there for two months on a wheelchair. And then he got on crutches. And this man taught him how to use crutches. He could walk on crutches without even having his feet on the ground. Oh. <laughs> so, they're being yeah. so they're worried yeah. about this stuff. And he was on crutches for two years. So we, then we lived that together. And uh, we even, we still did something together. We went hunting. 
hunting together. It was one crutch and then on the other hand, a crutch that came around and just did that kind of stuff. I'll never forget that that teacher who he, I know he was sent by God to do that. Oh, that's, that's, you can't even name that. Yeah, yeah we just but there again, going back, we never we never talked about it. We just get better to go and, you know. Well, I think that's what's so important is it's it's still your story and there can still be this happened, this is the way it was. People didn't talk about stuff. And I needed support throughout that, even though they didn't know how to give that support to me. And I think that's important for even people now is it's so much easier or conditioned to be like, ah, oh, it's fine, I'm over it or whatever. But we have to be able to look at, but are we? You know, and I think and this is where I need to talk about childhood wounds. And I know people are like, well, what are your parents like about well, not blaming my parents at all for this because I, and I, I know everything that happened to me was a gift for me to be doing this work and i had i've said many times on this podcast i have two amazing parents and i'm getting to sit here with one of them but it's we weren't given the tools like your parents we we don't know all the stuff that we know now and that's just what you did there wasn't this emotional support thing it was like the physical stuff get back to work that was just how it was at that time well they were doing their best please, please. Right. And that because that was just and they may and they may have they don't remember that they discussing. Well, I think when we had that discussion a few years ago, and you had said, like, I just remember being out in the field, like they took heat to the hospital because again, physically that needed attention, right? Like oh, yeah. and you can understand that. But then again, when I'm imagining you as this 11 year old boy, like standing out in this field by yourself, not knowing what's going to happen to your brother. And, and again, like you can imagine that situation where everybody is worried and all of that kind of stuff, but the emotional stuff, we don't always pay attention to. We don't always give the same merit and even maybe not at the same time, right? Because physically that, that needed to happen right now. But this is hopefully a lesson for everyone now is that when something physical happens, we have to also address it. There is an emotional component to that that needs to be addressed. And it just so happens that you and Pete are like a living example of both. Like we have both. You know, anytime there's an accident or people witness it, not even just you're the one in the accident, you're driving by a horrific scene. Like you might remember that and your body remembers that. And an example, I was telling Aria that I was coming back here to talk to you about this. And, and she said to me this morning, she's like, oh, like, like the way that I'm afraid of heights because of when I fell off this front ledge at my daycare when I was two. And I will never forget this. So she was a super adventurous kid, you know, like never had any fear on playgrounds and stuff. And then all of a sudden, it, and it was just like night and day. One day, all of a sudden, she was terrified. We would be up on a playground and there would be like an opening, you know, where you could slide on a pole or <laughs> going back to last week's podcast about you know embracing the result. Yeah. But uh anytime there was an area where she like there was an opening and there wasn't a close thing, she would freeze. And I would have to like go up on the playground and hold her hand and walk her through going on and I couldn't like put it together. I had no idea what happened because I hadn't witnessed anything like that. Well then it came out from you know I don't know how much longer a week later or a month later that her daycare provider told us that she actually like they had a you know stairs but then there was like a ledge and there wasn't there was just bushes below that and she must have fallen off that one day. And it was probably two, three sure. feet. But she remembered that so now anytime like we're at a water park. And going up all those tall things, like she, it's like, I have to coach her through that because like her body remembers. And, you know, talking to my sister earlier, like she had to make some phone calls about something that had happened and having to do that same thing a year ago, even though the instant didn't happen to her, it was just being involved in it, it brought up these emotions. And so it's like paying attention to that. So when you got emotional, like that's your inner child, like, Thank you for finally like speaking to this and feeling this and processing this because I've been holding on to this for 54 years. I can't believe I still get emotional 
I never buy them before I look. Which I was talking about now, I didn't find that for 50, 30 years. I was I kind of chopped it around one was I got a little old shopping. Really? Yeah. And I guess that's deeper than I thought, but I never, it doesn't, my mother and I have talked about it numerous times. We're, we're okay with it. But evidently, still must be down there. Well, I think that's the important part is that we do find ways to compensate. We do find ways to navigate through our lives, but you can also see how it does show up in your life now. Like the way that, you know, just your relationship with him now, like you can see that throughout the years, like you kind of always had this, I don't know, whether it's protective or some kind of energy around. I think there is a look back at my life. One of the choices that I made in the business, and even with you now personal jobs, um, you do look out for other people. And I think this part of that is a uh, taking care of them. And I never know I even did that on time. But I did talk to Peter a couple of weeks ago on Tell Her Run has its podcast. And he said, Paul, I said, uh, it really doesn't bother him. He goes, I said, Why is that? He goes, I was taken care of. And I never thought of that until so I talked to Tammy and she kind of explained that. And yeah, he wanted to love me to take care of. And I don't, I'm not a book staff anybody for what happened over those years. And I'm like, again, I never knew, never knew that. Right. And I think that's what can be so powerful about this is you can still have this conversation, still process those emotions, and still know that they did the best. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to mean that, like, wow, no one supported me, no one helped me. No. Like, it's not about that. Like, because. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's such an important message for people because sometimes we are, we don't want to go there because we don't want to stir things up or we don't want to seem ungrateful. I mean, I had a whole podcast on how you can still get childhood wounds, even if you had a pretty good childhood, like me. And it's one of those cases well, where we're all just. You said something to me last week. It's one of the other podcasts. And I said, man, there's people out there that are things way worse than what happened to me. And that's probably why I never talk about it. Obviously, my brother went through worse things than I did during that time. And that's, that's what I look at things. I mean, there's always, always some people suffering worse. So I, I don't feel. Right. But I your don't. emotion is telling you that little Paul needed you to feel this. Little Paul needed to be seen in this. And he needed to know that, hey, you are supported in this. And it wasn't your fault. It was an accident. You know. And I always knew that. I already knew it wasn't my fault. It's a little fine little hall. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't understand that. But I see there's always somebody worse with worse problems. I wouldn't go like that way. Dealt with it or just what's the reason? Calling him out of the fire. Like it's not about who had it worse. It's that this was your experience. And we can know that. And I know that too. There's a million people who have had worse than me. Yes. But my inner child, like, I need you to validate my experience, though, and to process what I went through. Because if I don't, there are going to be blocks to where then I can't help other people. Like, well, it's limiting that. Okay, no, that's probably why I never really thought of it. Never brought it back up. But no one came to me. Ha, 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 ha. Third of five. Right. <laughs> oh, but he's good. We're Very persistent. Yeah, <laughs> but the, the thing is, is, like you said, like you just always have been helpful. But look how you sharing this. How many people you could be helping by saying, "Hey, you know what?" That's part of the reason I, I did this today. Is to hopefully help someone with our line that you know themselves or help someone else that were involved with something like that. You know what, my though, you have that first or like. Well, and it's, it can be little things too. It doesn't have to be this major traumatic yeah, event, yeah. you know, and I have talked about this just in, in little cases with my kids about, you know, when Arlo gets upset about a Lego, like, well, that's his experience in his little world. That's a big deal, you know? And so I can honor that and be like, I see that you're upset about this. I think it's ridiculous, but you know, if you don't say those things, yeah. I can. Cause I know like that's a big deal for him. And so again, when they get hurt, like I know that there's emotional part of that too. So I was just telling him earlier that a couple of weeks ago, my kids were playing and 
both my kids are crazy strong and are they thought this game was me great i knew i knew where i would go i probably should have shut it down but kids are kids and here we are so arlo has a pillow you know like holding it up and she's kicking it so you guys can all imagine where this is going and he didn't have the pillow up soon enough and she clocked him right in the face and he got bloody nose and it was like it was coming out of his mouth and it was like i was like oh boy like i didn't know if he busted his teeth and he's just like am i bleeding I'm like yeah buddy you're, you're bleeding and but the thing was is that happened to arlo but i saw aria's face i saw oh my gosh what did i just do to my brother like she was legit scared and terrified and so once you know and that was an important lesson for us too to understand like how we need to stay present and how we need to stay grounded in those situations like you said like how do you even process what just happened or stay calm in a situation like that because oftentimes we can go into you know flight where someone just takes off or i could have took off and went running you know you might have not been there to help and talk to pete in that moment because you were just i gotta get out of here i'm so scared or we just freeze and you can't do anything you know in those situations and that's when ego takes over and so but I, I had to make sure that after that happened and Arlo was okay and all that stuff that I brought both kids back and we talked about emotionally how they felt about that and making sure they were emotionally okay before they went to bed that night. Because physically, yes, we made sure they were fine. But then after was coming back around and talking about it emotionally. And that's like fortunately what we didn't get. But here we are 54 years later. Emotionally giving you our doing needed five seconds. I remember when we first talked about this is, like if you were to close your eyes and imagine yourself going out into that field when you were 11 year old Paul was standing out there, like just putting yourself back in that, that feeling or like, what would you say to him if you could have been the adult that went to him? Or would you try to comfort him and explain to him what happened? I mean, be real. This is what it is. Don't sure hold it. Just be there for him, right? Right then and there. Yeah. And, uh, obviously, there couldn't take time to don't hide those things, good or bad. Right. Be your front right away and talk about it. We're just to like hug him and just let him cry and let him like unload that. Because yeah. like, what a heavy thing to just be frozen in that feeling, but to just have someone in that moment like, okay, yeah. let him out. Yeah. And, and my my parents may have done that. I don't remember. <laughs> You know, I'm sure they, I'm sure they were there talking about it, but I never. Well, and that's an important aspect too, is that sometimes you, you may block things out. Oh, and, and that's another protective mechanism that, that we have, isn't well, it? Well, we are sure a lot of people that, if you're, you're on a farm, you got your to or something. I'm not, you still hear my dad tell me, as long as you hurt, I'm worried about it. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed about that and all, but maybe you just kept, and that's part of it. And I think that's where it's like now that we know better, we can do better and making sure that you're, even though it might be a long way from your heart, your heart still felt that. Oh, and yeah. Your heart still needs healing. Yeah. Well, my mom and dad, they were, they were always there for us kids. Yeah. That was a little different. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I think that's like you can start to see where each generation got like a little bit better and a little bit better about honoring that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because you've always been. I know I can tell you anything. So like you can tell that like, somewhere along the line, like you were able to give us what maybe you didn't receive. You know, and I'm doing that same thing with my kids. It's like taking it those steps further. And so you you did that. Like you reparented us in that way by knowing that there was always a safe place for us to talk and open up or to check in. And so that's kind of a cool thing that you did without even realizing. Well, I never I never tried to shoot a cold or anything. Just straight up. What are Yeah. Yeah. But some people's versions of dealing with it is actually not dealing with it. It's like, it's like, let's just move on. Let's leave that with it. I've been called out on that one. Your definition of dealing with it is not mine. <laughs> and that's fine. But I think that's what this was about today with like helping you like actually emotionally deal with it and just. Yeah have that moment to just walk through that and validate like yeah like i needed support too and while i was able to find ways around it and to be able 
Because it, it's not even just that one instance. Like it was that was something that didn't just leave. Like you were with you, you're still with your brother like, almost every day. You know, so you still yeah. see it as this constant reminder. You know, so even when you go you guys go back to school, you see how it's affecting him. And like this is just this constant reminder that Well, he couldn't or except Raleigh could never lift anything over thirty pounds. It's supposed to happen that. When it came time for sports, it's not nice. Well, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do sports. And I was, I would be able to do sports. I'm kind of hard to watch, you know, or do that or much through life. And uh, then we got married. One of the children even had our children. Because of the accident, it did. Thank goodness. And uh, so we watched, watched that through the years. But I he got two hips, two hips put in since that time. He's rocking and rolling. Dude walks every single day. He's an outside every day guy. So shout out to you. When I was doing that, yeah. him and his wife, they did their outside every day as well. So, right. yeah. But I just think about like, even that kind of stuff is whether or not you consciously thought, well, this is my fault. You know, you might not have actually thought that. Or like, if he doesn't have kids, like, is that my fault? Or if he can't do sports, like, yeah. and maybe carrying around this guilt that I can do these things and he can't. Or, I did volunteer. I did march a show for a while ago about two brothers that went through a tongue accident. And one brother hit me with one brother and you know, and brought right back to me. And uh, I talked with my brother Pete about that movie. And that's my that's when he told me so that doesn't bother me. I knew that situation, but I think through the years that didn't and did bother me that I could do this stuff he couldn't but I yeah. I don't sell guilt because I want to do sports, but I also didn't want to do it. Right. I was just going to ask, like, how much of that maybe held you back? I think quite a bit. You were just here to prove that bottom line. You know, we'll sort it. But we found other ways to have fun. Yeah. It was a, I shouldn't say water away, but on a football team, but it would probably be the best fun. We've got to keep everybody. I mean, all just, but I mean, we, everybody in school moved the hard hand to be involved. But it was, I look back at that now, it's quite hard, you know. Do that. Not really sit back, but we're kind of loved in my mind. Yeah. But we might get your breath. Yeah. But I think just even just talking about it now, I was like, wow, yeah, I didn't realize that. Maybe I there were areas where I I didn't go all out or I didn't do as many things yeah. because I didn't like leave them behind, you know, or yeah. I think that that happened even more. Right. Well, and that can certainly play out in so many other areas of your life. You know, it may not even be revolved around your relationship with him, but in other ways, like, are there other areas of your life where maybe that theme continues? You know, that's where, like, this kind of stuff is, like, you want to explore that because it may not be directly related to that certain instance, but it might show up in a completely different way at work or other relationships where, yeah, maybe I'm afraid to do the big cool thing because I don't want to leave people behind and I can speak to that and just even this healing journey like if I'm going to be going on this like what happens if people aren't ready to come with me you know I think so I guess we got our instructor instructor this in 1984 together and I think that we're one of our successes we're so well together yeah and I think part of that we're standing off not to each other yeah. even at that age yeah and we were successful yeah building the company and all our son walking in you know, we just sort of went on, but yeah, yeah, and in right. some ways that really strengthened your bond, probably. And it allowed yeah. you to work well and figure out how you can complement each other because there are things that you did well that maybe he couldn't, or vice versa, and you apply that into your business. We, we did, yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, I think we worked very well together. It's kind of ironic, like mm -hmm. a little bit off the floor here, but I see we're pretty good in construction business. I always love learning the job, yeah. you always enjoy finishing it. So we just kind of roll. Yeah. We just involved in four or four years now doing that. I love that point because, again, when we talk about the extremes, and I think a couple of weeks ago I talked about this pendulum and how it can go to extremes. And so you are maybe that person who is an amazing caregiver and you love taking care of people, but oftentimes we do it to our detriment where we completely forget to take care of ourselves. Or you're at the other extreme where you don't like look out for anyone, right? So Neither one of those extremes are healthy for us. But it's like if you can find a way, and both of them are a result of some sort of childhood wound. But if you can find the healthy balance of that, 
you can make that work where I can be an amazing caregiver, but I don't do it at the sacrifice of myself. And I think that's where witnessing what you two have done is you found a way to take this like <laughs> pretty traumatic experience yeah. and it really taught you how to complement each other. And then you took that into your business. And so, and maybe there are, yes, maybe still have some limitations where the pendulum swings this way and maybe too far this way. But I think for the most part, like you guys really have found a way that it's really helped strengthen your relationship, especially in how you complement each other at work. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So there can be like beautiful things that come out of that stuff if we're willing to look at it, but also being able to look at like, oh, maybe where is it? Maybe holding me back still, or, you know, that's uh, the other thing that we always get to explore. But yeah. So what we were going to do, we still doing this? Yeah. Good. So. All right. So we're going to pause and actually go out to where this happened. Yeah. For the first time in 54 years. 54 years. No random word bothered. All right. So we're going to go do that. I don't know. We will, we won't have, I, don't, I didn't plan on videoing this because I wanted it to be just yeah. for you. We had planned to come back and kind of talk a little bit about what that was like. So we'll what, see. If you don't know, this is very unscripted. I don't know how you're going to. Yeah, well, either. I just wanted to tell you where yeah. this happened. You know, be expanding for a little bit, maybe more fence to her where we were at and how it went down. And then I'm looking to give the little 11 year old a oh, big old hug. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm actually looking forward to it. Yeah. It's a little cold here on it, which I didn't think I needed, but. <laughs> see, that you can best me to. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah. And, yeah, that's another story. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I've, I've been apologizing a lot today because of the whole technology snafu. And that'll hard for me to podcast for her. Well, I, I mentioned that like last week. I said, I need to say, you notice how often I apologize. And I even catch myself apologizing when I get emotional. Like, I'm not sorry for being emotional, but I was inconveniencing you and taking time because. I all around that four times that you can listen to my apology. I need work in progress, people. I don't want to be a burden. That is my childhood rule. Is so when things weren't going as planned, I just started to feel I was getting triggered, and you could sense that. And so oh. me getting triggered was me over apologizing. So don't call me on the way on podcast. Yeah, right. Next topic. <laughs> you have a million things Danny apologizes for and shouldn't. So oh, all right, I'm looking forward to going out there and all right, showing her where it all happened. You guys, part of this, yeah, our efforts, yeah, and that might be the case for every, yeah, it might not be the case <laughs> for everybody, but I think that's an important thing. You're like, what do I need to maybe get closure? And you, you have to remember that your closure is never lightly. I should say never. Might not come from people. You may not get the apologies from people. You may not get the. That has to come from within you, and I think that you're finally at a place where it's like, no, I think I want to do this for myself. Well, not so much for myself. I, I want to let my family know what happened. Such a huge part of them, so you and who you are. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, possibly, I want the kids to know what happened. Yeah. Why did Why did all the people be looking around? Why was Dad this way? I, I think for their benefit, I think it'd be nice to know their story about my. Yeah. And it's, I don't know. I hear from other people like I wish Aunt oh, Dad would have told this. Yeah. And I always thought, well, they don't need to know this part of my life. It's hurt the part. But I guess that's part of my story. Part of my life. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's, oh. time for, it's time for me to share a little bit of that. So really they understand a little better. So we are doing this for you with the overflow mm -hmm. come to everybody. <laughs> there you are. I talk about that on another podcast too about the base and let this be about you and all right little call and then yes we will all receive the overflow from being gracious with your story yeah this is for you sure. thank you all right on that note we're gonna go out and hopefully we will come back and share a little bit about what that was like all right we'll be back yeah so we drove out to where this all happened and your, your experience, what that was like for you.
Yeah, it was a Vanderbilt exact spot where we started to throw opera together, and it was a kind of surreal. And yeah, my daughter was at the shore. This all happened. He said, I've been by there a million times over the year. First time I had a Kevin Merrill with me, which was pretty special. It's all right. Well, I think something too, when we are combing through our stories, pay attention to the stories where you remember exactly where you were, exactly what you were wearing, exactly what someone said. Like there's a reason for that. And generally there's something in that. There's a memory, there's a lesson, there's some healing. There's a reason that you could take me exactly out to that spot and you knew, I mean, you could walk through that entire scenario and be able to still see it. And that's where, you know, even my, you know, sophomore whale bully comment, like, I don't have very clear, distinctive memories of certain things but that I do. And that's because there was something there for me. I needed to come back to that. And oftentimes when you're looking at your own story and thinking like, oh yeah, like I remember what this person said and what they were wearing. Like, look at that. Cause there's probably something in that for you. And so that was super awesome and brave for you to be able to go out there. And like I said, not everyone has to go to the place to find healing, but you did. And it was, that was really beautiful to experience. And thank was, you for me be a part of it. It was kind of ironic because, um, you know, farmers, they rotate their crops, corn, beans, whatever. And when we get out there, that field with the tax or going at where is your old field? That was kind of, and me, and that like those great harbors, all different crops, and that field was or a field exactly what it was. I mean, what divine. I mean, it was right. And thank you for, like I said, letting me be a part of that and being able to give you a hug in that moment. And yeah, well, thank you for pushing me to this level to experience that again. That little shell. That little shell, yeah. Yeah, so that rules this. But uh, yeah, it was, it was good. She shared with Montana here, you know, this daughter was just proper. Taught me a lot over the years. Love you. Oh, well, yeah, it's been a day. Yeah. It's been a day. Yeah. Yeah. A day. Well, I'm going to tell them all about Groundy and when he goes home, I'm going to be able to have big emotional release today. And that. Which I did not expect. I mean, the service. Well, we were kind of talking about that. Like after we got off, he was just like, I didn't expect it. I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. Like that's what happens. And that's telling you that there's, there's still that little boy that needed to talk about this, that needed you to validate that experience. And yeah, I did actually need support. Even though I've dealt with it and I've gotten through it and I've learned from it and I've grown from it, still need his support. I think that. Well, it's, it's surprising me at 65 years old that I thought I had those emotions buried and I got triggered again. I was, I was not comfortable at first. I didn't know what I could do that. But you sat in it and you kept going and yeah, you shared so, your story with us. Yeah. It takes a lot of bravery to sit in discomfort and emotion that we are taught to under the rug and well the reason i agreed to do this today was i hope it helps someone out gone through similar situations or well not that similar i just hope it helps someone out to went up there close to their kids yeah. like help one person with it be great that's that's why this podcast is even here because i reckon i can help one person feel seen in their story then it is worth it and you oh you absolutely did that for someone. And even just for me to be able to witness that, like you helped me and it's a reminder. Don't hold on to this stuff. Don't bury this stuff because you don't want to, I don't want to relive this stuff 55 years from now if I'm not processing it now. And so it's a powerful reminder for me and even for my kids who are at that age. If they experience something, how can I not only support them physically, but also emotionally? And so it's a very powerful lesson, whether people have experienced that level of trauma or not. And like, even just looking at our little people now, remembering that we have to support them. And it may come at different times. 
but always making sure that we're checking in and we're sure we're people too. And knowing that it's safe to express that because, yeah, you're a guy, like, tough it out, get back to work. And that's exactly right. So you are helping change a generation by sharing your story yeah. and allowing yourself to get emotional on here. Because there's a lot of your generation that you didn't, you didn't have that support pool and that wasn't modeled. So right there, you're helping people be like, oh my gosh, like, I was actually. I don't look at it as a, as a, a weekly, a week thing anymore. I, I didn't hear their goals. Yeah. to talk about this, but now I look back at it. Yeah, I should have talked about it years ago. Um, here we are. Here we are. You just happen to have a daughter who will hit the with inner child work and <laughs> like, catch you. But it is interesting, and I, you know, I talk about my friend Zoe on here a lot, and we were having a conversation about our dad. I'm hoping sometimes she'll come on and share some stuff where that she had these beautiful conversations with her dad and how healing that was and how long he had been holding on to some of these things. And it was just what a gift for him to be able to finally express these things and process these things. You know, he's now in his heaven, you know, so very similar. And so yeah, giving that, that gift to the little Paul, but to all of these other people out here were now tuning in and be like, wow, I, I need to feel that. I need to. I just need to validate that. I need to go back to my little person inside of me and say, I can chew. And that's really what today was about. Like to go back there and be like, I'm here for you, Paul. Like, yeah, the key need in that, you know, that's why it needed to be about you and not about these other people, not about your grandchildren, because you are always of service to everyone else. It's a beautiful gift, but this one just needed to be for him. Oh, well, all your dads out there in the world, all your days come out. Take that special time. Spend that with your kids. Tammy and I, we usually take an annual walk. I love that. We share stories. I think that's kind of where this started. About our walk. Little dads out there. Take those walk with your kid. You know, you're supposed you're to be you. vulnerable and let them in. Like, yeah. you always have to be the tough. Like, I think that's because as a kid, you, we intuitively want that. We want all of the emotion. We want all of the love. We don't want it boxed up and like, oh, this is only what I'm and that's where I think you have given me such a gift is because you, you have been open so much and have shared. And so you have been emotionally available for me. And like, especially as an adult. And I think sometimes when we come around like, well, I'm the dad and I'm supposed to be playing this role and I can't show emotion. But your kid need that. They need that modeling. They need to know that it's safe for you to be like, how to process their own emotions. It doesn't make them weak to cry. Like show them how to move through that and learn the lessons from it helping them out that way you know but we know like we box it up and i think that's such an important thing is there is so much strength and vulnerability and i think that's where men and dads and stuff can really really create a beautiful relationship with their kids when they are emotionally available as well not just the surface level i put food on the table or roof over your head or like you may feel emotionally safe with you well i've always i've always felt so familiar with others but i think if she's walked her head in the rears, I think we'd actually gotten closer. Oh, yeah. In a, in a good way. That's why I really, really urge dads out there, get close to your daughter in the Yeah. Well, and it was so much of hearing his stories, whether it was with work or just personal stuff, and even some of his childhood stuff that helped put pieces of the puzzle together for me. I was like, oh my gosh, like that makes sense of why I do this. And, and you can start to see some of this being generational, but so much of that healing started with you. Like you, I can come in and be like, oh, I'm changing this story for my family, but you really did that. I just picked it up and took it to another level with inner child work. Oh, I'm a achiever. But you really were already changing those patterns in the society, like for conditioning and stuff. We were already doing so much of that. And model that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Signing off. Thank you all for welcoming my daddy oath on this podcast. And yeah, thank you for sharing your story. You know, it is going to help a lot of people. And you are just a gift well, to her. Thank you also. Appreciate it. All right. We'll get back to our vlog. Maybe we'll have, I do want to have you on here sometime to talk about all the other stuff that he's had to work through. Yeah, we'll work some love. 
a lot of stuff for child and business stuff. It's it's pretty pretty cool and pretty powerful. And like I said, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be here if I didn't have my mom. Uh, don't worry, here. Big part of my life is for each other. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.